yesterday morning, God was speaking to me about all of these things that I once believed or bought into, the so-called expertise of the field of psychology. And I was watching my daughter, Nurse Jeremiah, and I was thinking about this ridiculous, ridiculous theory called the Oedipal Complex that Freud plucked from Greek mythology, which also, by the way, is where the theory of narcissism came from, and how everyone exalts Freud within the field of psychology. I'll be honest, I never did. I always thought he was a nut, but I know that my mentors did. I know that they thought highly of him, and that so much within the field of psychology is based on this coked out perverts theories. And the Oedipal Complex basically posits that children have this desire for the opposite sex parent. And, you know, the field of psychology will say, no, this isn't sexual, it's sensual. Freud wasn't meaning it in a sexual way. Where, where is this in the word? Like, where is this in the word that a, a, a daughter has some weird, inappropriate identification and longing for the opposite sex parent, so a son to a mother, a daughter to a father, just in case anyone's confused about that. You never know in this day and age. And that they feel jealousy toward the other parent, like as though a child doesn't need that parent too, like as though they don't want that parent too, and that they're having some sort of sexual battle and caught in a love triangle. This man was demented, like he was demented. And God was making me see that so clearly. Also, when I say he was a coked out pervert, it's a well-known fact that, that he was using a lot of coke when he was coming up with these theories, clearly studying up on Greek mythology and just pulling things out of the air. And this is the basis by which we understand psychoanalysis. This is how we're going to work with people with souls. Then he goes and completely distorts what God has said regarding the flesh, the sinful nature, the condition that we're in, the conscience and counselor of the Holy Spirit who gives us godly grief and convicts us, and that part of you that is receiving God's ministry and making decisions. I mean, he's completely distorted the human condition that God told us we have in the word. Let me tell you in a nutshell that the impulsive part of your personality is described as the it. This part is driven by pleasure and is repulsed by pain. It wants to gratify. That's all it's concerned about is gratification and everything that's in your drives and impulses. That's called the flesh. And what God said is that it's sinful. But what Freud did was normalize it. Oh, this is in everyone. You evolved this way. The superego is the judgmental and morally correct part of your personality. The only part that's moral about you is God. And so then he goes on to say that the ego is this part that is mediating between the two. Oh, I see. So the moral part of you is a little extra. So you need something to mediate between these two parts, and that's your ego. Do you see how he has distorted the human condition and everybody went along with that. Like, how quickly are you ready to go to a therapist? How quickly are you ready to go to a doctor? Do you know where any of this comes from? So when I say to you that these things are idolatry and they're witchcraft and they're based on a rejection of God and his word and his truth, you know, at face value, you're like, nah, I believed in this all my life. Where else would we go? God, please. Only biblical people did that. We don't do that anymore. God gave us medicine. I'm not exaggerating that these are things that I hear. God gave us science. It's not that, that way anymore. No, there's no more spirits. Oh, okay. When did that change? When science that came around and said, there is no God, there is no creator, you evolved. When that God denying himself said, here's science so you don't have to rely or obey or submit to me anymore. That was the burden of the Jews, right? That's the narrative in counterfeit Christianity. So God was causing me to see this very clearly last yesterday morning. And how stupid, how stupid that I ever, ever believed anything in this field. I really did not buy into Freud. He gave me a sick feeling in my stomach. But there were things that I pursued and pursued in this field because I didn't have the truth. I thought that somewhere in there I was going to find truth. It was like shopping in a department store for a plunger. I mean, how was I ever going to find what I needed if I was in the wrong store? And it just was so clear to me in that moment that he was leading me through all of these lies that I had believed, that I had once believed. And he has me in this position right now where... I finally have this 
opportunity to demonstrate that I believe in truth. And it's really hard. Like, it's really hard. He has me just like, you know, I, I read about like the Old Testament prophets and servants like Noah and Job and Abraham and how they just obeyed. Like they just believed. No questions asked. Like they just obeyed. Okay, you're telling me to do this. All right, I'm going to contend with, obviously you have to contend with your feelings in order to obey. That's implied. I don't think the word needs to spell that out for you, although some seem to think that it does. How hard do you think it was for Abraham to take his only son and be ready, like, be ready to sacrifice him to the Lord. But he did it. He didn't question or fight with or argue with God. He was just ready to do it. And I'm very aware that that's the position that I need to have to be ready to lose everything. And at the same time, believe as Abraham did, the Lord will provide right up to the last minute. The Lord will provide. It's really hard. And I suspect it would have been hard enough without all of this garbage that I ingested from the world, without pagans, you know, telling me, are you sure you want to turn down this deal? Yes, I'm sure. I've already given you the stipulations that God gave me. I told you that this is it. This is what I will accept. That's it. You sure? You sure? You sure? How many times do I need to be asked if I'm sure that I believe in God, if I'm sure that I'm going to obey God? Because the implication is I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot for not believing in the world. I'm an idiot for believing in him. You know what's even harder? Is when you bring that to the community that's supposed to be believing with you, and they don't say anything. When you're standing in faith, they don't even know what to do with it. But you know what? God told me a long time ago, let this people turn to you. You must not turn to them. So I'm not going to turn to anyone for support. I'm going to let him do what he's going to do in people, and I'm going to continue to offer this. And he's either going to move you to step into the shoes of the offerings that he's presenting, or you're going to be put through your own thing. But I'm going to tell you right now, you guys need to support each other. You need to be there for one another. You need to not be silent when people are going through stuff. And you need to remember that what affects one part of the body affects the whole body. So if someone's going through something, you need to share that burden and step into their shoes and encourage them. And don't just act like you're being some sort of support on the outside. By saying sweet things, stand in faith with them. Put yourself in that position. Don't let that offering be in vain. Otherwise, the bottom line is you don't believe. You don't believe if you're not able to do that, if you're not willing to do that. And I'm well aware that most people don't believe. I'm well aware. I know the response when you believe. Do you know what the response is when you believe? You stand in that belief and you say, this is what I know to be true. God's going to come through because I know this to be true. And here's where it is in the word. And let me share some of my testimony with you. And here's what he's doing with me right now. I'm standing in faith with you. He's testing me and I'm standing and it's helping me to understand what you're going through a little bit more. You guys are going to need to support each other because I'm not going to be here. And I have a feeling that many of you at that time will then understand what it is that I went through while I was here. But I'm well aware that many of you can't be bothered to even consider it. I know what belief looks like. I'm going to keep sharing my testimony, but I'm not going to turn to anybody for support. Because honestly, it's too painful. The next thing that God led me to was Acts 9 regarding Saul's conversion. And I'm going to read it to you, and then I'm going to show you the places that he was pointing out to me. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciple. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? By the way, Saul was a Pharisee. Saul had, he had reputation among the Jewish leaders. It's not like Saul had nothing to lose in doing what he was doing. Saul gave up everything to do what he was doing so that he might be persecuted, so he might be hunted. I mean, like there are Judaism, Islam, some Christians believe that Paul changed Christianity, changed Judaism, changed the law. They talk all kinds of evil against Paul. What did Paul have to lose? Everything. He had a high position. He was well regarded among the Jews and suddenly hunted by his own people. 
Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord. He answered, the Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man named from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Paul has been made blind for a reason, because God wants to demonstrate what happens when you're given eyes to see. And just as he told the blind man when he was here, he's come to restore sight to the blind and make those who claim to see blind. Okay, so Paul did these things in ignorance, and yet upon learning his debt and understanding what he had been doing, he gave his entire life. And here's what God is encouraging me with, because honestly, he is my only support. He is the only one who understands what he has me doing. What he's saying to me is you, like Saul, had everything to lose. You had a reputation. You had wealth. You, like Saul, really thought that what you were doing was right. And so I made you blind, and then I gave you eyes to see, and I'm not going to forsake you, even while no one around you believes. And even while everyone in the world is telling you you're an idiot, you've made a foolish decision, people in your own family think you did something really dumb, you just made a series of really bad decisions. Never mind the fact that none of this served you. Nothing has served you. You've given everything for free. But... Yep, it's a series of bad decisions. Now it's going to be the burden of your family, right? No, it's not. I don't need a backup plan for God. I know God. And it feels terrible when the people that you love think you're delusional. And then the community that's supposed to be standing in faith, not all of them, those who eat from the bread that you're bringing to them every day, one who's housed, not standing in faith, not even getting what that is. Lord Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your holy people in Jerusalem, and he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. So God says he's going to suffer a lot for my name. And he says elsewhere in Scripture, the one who has the greater debt, is the one who's going to love God more. Then Ananias went into the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Do you see the parallels? between spiritual sight and physical sight that God is demonstrating. And what happens when you've been given spiritual sight, you will do anything and you you have a tendency to understand what you're being given, what you're being presented with. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem? among those who call on his name and hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests yet Saul grew more and more powerful and battled battled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah I want you guys to know something that I don't believe God has to take me to the wall like this just for my sake this is not just for my sake I've told you several times that he's taking me to the wall to reveal his glory to you to you I have been proving myself to God. He's not just doing this for my sake. He's doing it to reveal his glory to you, to the realtor, to the people who are watching, to the people who are around. Are you going to look at it now or are you going to wait till I'm gone? Are you going to look at what I'm doing right now or are you going to wait until I'm gone? After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him, but Saul learned of their plan. Day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him, but his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. 
boy, what a glamorous life Paul is leading. How easy it must have been for him to leave that status that he had and the safety that he had to go and live like this. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him, his own people, to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. Live in the life. And those who slander Paul continue thousands of years later. They're still slandering him. They're still calling him a liar. What did he gain by leaving everything that he left? What did he gain here in the world? Persecution? Being hunted? I mean, did, not, did Paul not say these things? This is what God's servants go through? Slandered the scum of the earth? Flogged in the synagogues? Left for dead? What did I leave in order to come to this glamorous place of sitting here waiting for God to do something so that I can keep my home? I've given you the books for free. The little bit of money that I was making on the books, I even lowered that and said, you know what? I'm just going to give you the books at my cost. I'll send them to you that way. Not anything have I taken from, for myself. And frankly, it's shameful that some of you can't even step into that so you can learn from the offering that I have to tell you to support each other, to acknowledge the faith that one of our members was standing in yesterday, to not turn to false gods, to find out whether their loved one was going to live or die. It honestly blows me away. The one time that I asked, pray with me, help me, encourage me, because I'm up against the wall. Y'all better examine your hearts and figure out why it is that you're so stuck in this counterfeit way of being so holy, being the body. What, what is this? It's not real. If you can't step into the position of another person and recognize that they being in the body are one with you and that you need to share the burden by stepping in that position and helping them to stand in faith, what are you going to do when God pulls the scales off your eyes and he starts telling you the things that you got to do and everyone in your family or everyone around you is telling you you're an idiot for leaving everything that you had to go do this thing that he has you doing. You're being built right now for that, but it's all fine and dandy for somebody else to do that. Just like it's all fine and dandy for the pastor at the pulpit to be talking and, and you're like, oh yeah, I'm so in my covenant. Yep, yeah, so in my covenant with everything that everybody else does for me. Jesus paid it all. Praise God. You're going to have to stand in this. You're going to be reminded of the people that you didn't support, who were offering to you, from whose bread you ate. They gave you your bread at the proper time, and you couldn't even be bothered, huh? That's counterfeit, guys. Oh, how sweet your emojis. Thanks. Thanks so much. I don't want anything to do with that. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among Jews to kill him, but Saul learned of their plan. Day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit and increased in numbers. I'm not going to ask for your support, but the one thing I'm going to ask is that don't let my offering be in vain. And it's not because of me. Again, it does nothing for me. I'm not asking you for anything. I'm not going to ask you for support. I'm not going to ask you for anything. What I do ask you is don't let my offering be in vain. Now, does that do anything for me at the end of the day, whether you learn something from my offering? Not really. Again, I'm not taking anything for, for me, but it's for your sake. Don't let my offering be in vain. It's for your sake. Look around at, what, at your home. Sit in your home and look around and take a minute to think about the offering of the person from who you're eating every day. They're providing food at the proper time. And I want you to think about what it would take for you to give up your careers 
for you to continue to pay for a building, for one person to live in that building who does not stand in faith continuously, will not stand in faith in the smallest things in their own life, continue to provide for them, continue to pay the mortgage on that building while not having any money coming in, give every single thing that God has them offering absolutely for free, every single day, all day, broken down, I never complained about it. I never said to you, look how I'm suffering in this so that I can give to you for free. No, I take my concerns to God. And now sitting in the house and everything that's left to give that up to God too. While one of my children thinks that I just made a series of bad decisions, while one of my children thinks that it wouldn't be a miracle, it wouldn't be the hand of God that constructed everything, It just would be good. It would be good if the building sold. Who understands what I'm doing, guys? Who has even tried to understand what I'm doing right now? And if you haven't tried to understand what I'm doing and I'm right in front of you, have you tried to understand what the apostles did? Have you tried to understand what Jesus did? Have you tried to understand what you've been given? I seriously doubt it because you couldn't go on to live in cowardly ways. You would understand the concept that You don't want to be joined with superficial people or a superficial spouse. Think about Jesus and his body. Think about Jesus and his wife, his church. Do you think he wants to be joined with someone who hasn't taken the time to consider what he did? I'm feeling this way. I'm feeling like I don't want to be joined with that person who in 2020 was supposed to be a partner in this with me was supposed to be in ministry with me. And for three years, three years later, can't take a Sabbath off because they don't believe. They don't believe. They can't do the simplest thing. I don't want to be joined with a partner like that. That's not an equally yoked partner. How do you think Jesus feels? Do you not understand that you have to be brought into becoming holy as the Lord is holy? You have to be brought into living like him, being like him. There's good reason for that. Have you guys ever been in a relationship with whom you're not equally yoked? It doesn't feel good. You feel like you're wiping that person all the time and you don't feel known. If those people cannot even step into the shoes of what you've done In order to understand your offering, why would you want anything to do with them? I'm not speaking for myself anymore. I am speaking regarding the offering of Jesus. What I'm experiencing right now is a little sliver of that. How everyone's just like, oh, well, yeah, that's cool that they did that. That's cool that Abraham, you know, was going to sacrifice his son. That's cool that Jesus died on the cross. So cool. That's how, that's how a lot of you act, like so cavalier about what's been offered to you. Am I not a human like you? Because some of you guys act like, oh, that's so cool that Carrie Ann's so strong. Am I not in the same condition you're in? Was Jesus not in the same condition that every single one of us are in? Then why are we so callous about the way we look at that sacrifice? Why are we so callous and detached from the fact that Jesus came as a man, lived a life without sin in the same condition we're in. Don't act like he was superhuman. He was just human, human who suffered in the same condition we're in. Exactly what I'm saying to you. Don't act so detached from what I'm doing as though it's, you know, oh, it's all good for Carrie Ann to live out that faith, but I'm not even going to do the slightest little thing to demonstrate my faith because I'm not Jesus. I've heard someone say that around here. I'm not Jesus. I can't do this. I'm not Jesus. Or others who say, I'm being crucified like Jesus, nailed to the cross like Jesus. It's such idle chatter. What are you even talking about? You think God's given you the cup Jesus had? Get a grip if you're saying that. You need a bracing reality check. You've been given a little sippy cup right now, and you have to be reminded to support other people in the body. What's up with that? Walk it with them. Trudge it with one another. God is not going to want to be joined with a body like this. I can tell you right now, he won't want to because he's showing it to me right now. I don't want to be joined with a body like this. It doesn't feel good. It hurts. 
you need to go return to God and be brought into a place where you understand what you've been given. I haven't asked for any encouragement. I asked for encouragement one time yesterday. First time I've done that. You know why? Because when God's bringing you up against a wall and everybody else in the world is speaking in contradiction to the will of God, it is reasonable that in those moments that you would ask others to stand with you, that you would ask others, please give me some encouragement. And let me show you what that looks like. You're making the right decision. Amanda did that yesterday. I know that what, is, what you're doing right now is hard. You have made the right decision. I know that God's word is true and that what you are doing is right. Here's my testimony. Here's a scripture. You stand with them in faith. I don't know why that is such a distant concept. How do you say you're trudging when you just give someone an emoji? Oh, yes, I'll put you on my prayer list. What, what is that, you guys? It's fake. And I can tell you right now, I don't want anything to do with that. I don't want to be associated with it. I don't think that I, I would imagine that Jesus doesn't either because it doesn't feel good to join with someone like that. It doesn't feel good over three years to be dragging someone along who says they believe, who says they're in ministry, who says, says, says all this lip service and doesn't stand. And then every time they're called on it, cries out apologies. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and nothing changes. Show me your sorry. Show me what sorry looks like. Show me what repentance looks like. Show me by your fruit. I don't want anything to do with it anymore. I'll continue doing what I'm doing because that's what God has me doing. And I know that that's what I'm required to do every single day until I'm out of here. I'll continue sharing my testimony. I'll continue showing up and teaching and sharing with you what he shares with me. But I don't want to be joined in a superficial way. I just don't want it. I don't want to be joined with people who won't take the time to understand what it is that I'm doing. And I think there's good reason why God says to his servant, let this people turn to you. You must not turn to them. You guys need to learn how to truly be here for each other because you're going to be here during that Antichrist reign in a couple of years. You're going to need the support and you're going to need to support others. And you're going to need to be brought into a place where you understand what is required in order to be joined with Christ. Most of you don't live in the same area, so use technology appropriately. And when you come back to the technology to respond to people in the body, you shouldn't be responding as you do in the world. In fact, you shouldn't even be responding that way in the world. Get off your social media. What's it doing for you? If you know that to be superficial, then get off of it because you don't go, you don't live in the flesh in one area of your life and then live in the spirit in another place. You're going to carry that flesh over into the places where you need to be living in the spirit. And don't start telling me that you're not responding because of your boundaries with technology then have boundaries with technology. I don't need to know about that. Go take it up with God. That does not absolve you of being there for each other. So learn how to be there for each other without being idols and without making the group an idol and without making technology an idol, okay? I understand that there are dangers there, but those same dangers exist in relationship. You need to show up with your heart when you're communicating with one another. I don't care if it's in person or on technology, you are not to return to the flesh and become superficial like the world. You don't love each other with emojis. You don't love each other even with superficial words. Be there for each other. Please go to God now and consider the things that I've said and the way that you ways that you need to change. I want to remind you that Jesus, that it says in the word in the book of John, that Jesus did not give himself to them because he knew what was in their hearts. And you cannot expect that he's going to give himself to you unless you're willing to examine what's in your heart.